Thank you for attending today. This is the Xylem webinar for getting full control of your wastewater networks to prevent system failures and inefficiencies. That'll be taken by myself, Paul Wolfew and Hannah Nyberg. And we're hoping to give you an overview of utilizing condition-based monitoring products and services for predictive maintenance and highlighting inefficiencies on larger pumping stations, in addition to eliminating blockages in terminal pumping stations feeding wastewater treatment plants. So we'll start with a little safety tip. So at the moment with the current world events, uh, disinfecting your everyday electronics is going to be a big topic as we move along. So smartphones, tablets, laptops and keyboards will need frequent cleaning and disinfecting. So power down the device, use a clean cloth or cotton pad, use a 70% isopropyl alcohol based disinfecting solution, never spray the cell phone, the laptop or the keyboard directly, wipe your device clean for a minimum of 20 seconds and only power on after your device is thoroughly dry and this should reduce the chances of you catching anything that you don't want to or anything currently flying around. Xylem as a global organization has a special COVID-19 response option where you can ask us to support you in any way you wish and the web address is on screen there if anyone wishes for us to share that with you we can let you know afterwards and send that along as well but simply call your local Xylem contact or go to the web address on screen and we can help you in any way we can to overcome any crises you may inquire you may encounter so today's agenda we're going agenda even we're going to give a brief introduction to xylem we'll introduce today's speakers we'll then talk about primary network pumping station challenges we'll then talk how we can overcome them we'll give an, an example on centralized catchment management and then we'll talk about condition-based monitoring and dashboards before opening up for any questions you may have as we speak on this webinar, the chat function is disabled. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions you may have as we move along. And once we get to the end of the presentation, we will then take some time to answer as many questions of those as possible before we have to finish. So an introduction to Xylem is we're an industry leader with global reach. We're a leading global water technology provider we have an unrivaled product portfolio with leading brands and solutions with approximately 16,000 global employees across 350 global locations. And we're currently doing business in 150 countries on six continents, which makes us uniquely positioned to solve all of our customers' challenges. So our work spans the entire water cycle. We start from the water intake we can handle treatment, testing, we deliver, and then collect that water back in at the other side, testing and treating it again, and return it back, ready to start again in the water cycle. So today's speakers, there's myself, which is Paul Wolfew. I'm a field sales engineer in the instrumentation controls and automation department at Xylem Water Solutions. I joined in April 2020. Uh, I've worked in various areas of the mechanical and pumping industry. I've got a broad knowledge of mechanical, hydraulic and electrical practices. I've dealt exclusively with end users, distribution, housing developers and water utilities in various sales and technical roles. I'll now hand over to Hannah, who will introduce herself and then take a portion of the presentation. Okay, hi all. Uh, my name is Hanna Nebe and I'm from Sweden. So if you think my English is a bit odd, that's why. Uh, I worked with Xylem for 13 years. Um, I'm currently working as a business development manager for system intelligence for the European markets. Uh, during the years with Xylem, I worked uh, mostly international uh, and worked with uh, developing different regions such as um, Asia, Middle East and South American markets, but the last years I've been focusing on the European markets. So then I will talk a little bit about our primary network pumping station challenges. 
So typical problems that pe people encounter out in pumping stations on a frequent basis could be a very high energy consumption. Pumps tend to be either oversized or just not energy efficient equipment. It is complex and difficult to design a pumping station and this is often because you have insufficient data or you don't have the co correct data available. I would say that pump station operators would say that the blockages of pumps is maybe the worst problem because you need to visit the pump station and you need to physically lift the pumps and manually clear the blockages within the pump. Depending on what you're pumping, this can happen at different frequencies. So this is both costly and not the nicest job to perform. We are often having an inability to reduce or keep a steady inflow to our termination pumping station and wastewater treatment works. Uh, and this can be that we are not keeping the effluent quality high enough during peak periods during the day or during peak periods based on seasonal variations or that we have a storm water event that is heavily inflowing into the sewer system. That this is happening means that you often have a lack of centralized catchment management. A failure of your pumps or pumping station means that you need human intervention on site in order to inhibit the stations that are connected and affected by the failing pumping station. We also today have a very aging infrastructure in many parts of the world. This means that you have legacy telemetry systems, you might even have electromechanical designs out in the station cabinets, you have maybe a single pump controllers, PLCs or generic RTUs that offer very little or maybe even none functionality to assist in managing your complete network in an intelligent way. So most of the time a pumping station is operated as a single station without taking into consideration its place in a network or line of stations. From a centralized perspective, um, we often are having old uh, solutions and they are not maybe even integrated. So we end up with uh, very little meaningful data, or in worst case, we have no data at all available. So how can we overcome these challenges? Uh, to protect and prolong the lifetime of your equipment, it is important that you use uh, basic equipment such as soft starter and soft stops. Um, I would say that one of the most important obstacles to overcome is to avoid and minimize unnecessary callouts at your pumping station. A callout never happens on a Wednesday, 10 o'clock. It's always on the evenings or on the weekends, of course. So this is what you want to avoid, both from a cost and time perspective. To do this, uh, we have introduced a lot of anti-clogging functionalities into our pumping systems that we are delivering. Xylem offers these solutions for pumps up to 200 kilowatts. So our solution detects if there is a blockage in the pump. When this is detected, it's important to automatically perform our auto reverse cycles to your machine to clear any of the blockages. In order to clear a blockage, many parameters have to be working together. The design of your pump's impeller plays an important role here, as well as also the design and the performance of the algorithm of the cleaning cycle software. You also need to make sure how you detect that the blockage has been cleared to avoid any unnecessary wear to your pump. Many out there can claim good results on different parts, like either on the software functionality side or on the hardware side. But it's important to make sure that you look at the complete picture and have an integrated solution. In our case, this means that we have the adaptive N impeller and a pump cleaning cycle features that are working in an optimal way together which give you an overall solution. Looking from the energy consumption side, uh, most people are looking at their larger station, which of course will consume a lot of energy. But we would also point out, do not disregard your smaller station as well, because if you add up all of your smaller station, uh, together they will consume a substantial amount of energy together. If you look at the picture here, you will see a smart um, technology that has been developed as an algorithm from us. And it's, um, it's an algorithm that continuously is searching for the most energy efficient point to operate the pumping station at. 
the system is calculating every pump cycle its optimum speed to perform at. This means that it will lower its operating speed every cycle until the most efficient point is reached. If something in the system is changing, the algorithm will detect this and do auto adjust of its speed in the upcoming pump and pumping cycle. This then will allow us to um, account for different inflow variations, peak periods, seasonal fluctuations in the system. It will always allow it to adapt to the current environment and operate at its most optimal way. And this is then done automatically in the system without any intervention from the operators or any adjustment by them. The next thing I want to talk about is the sump cleaning features as well. This means that uh, we want to get rid of any floating debris in the pump sump before it has a chance to accumulate into big chunks of rags, get rid of any grease that could clog the pump. So we want to reduce the risk of blockages and also sedimentation, but it also reduces the risk of odor in the station as well. <clears throat> we want to avoid these cleaning trucks going out into the station because those are a lot um, costly for you and it also might you might need to do inhibit of other station in order to clear um, uh, the station during the cleaning time. So in our system uh, we are pumping down until we reach a snoring point and when the snoring point is um, detected by it power drops then the pumps will stop. We also have pipe cleaning um, functionality built in that will allow the pumps to operate at maximum capacity for a short period of time to make sure you get rid of any sediments in the piping system. With that said, I will let Paul talk now about how you can operate and control a network of these good pumping stations. Thank you, Hannah. So centralized catchment management is where we can intelligently remote control all of our pump stations, connected pump stations on those networks in real time. There's many advantages to this in that we can then use peak demand management to improve our operational control. This can then smooth out flows into the treatment works to ensure that you're not giving a large inflow at any one point and instead spreading those out along the day to make sure that they're not overwhelming what's already in your treatment works. Severe weather event proactive action can then prevent a large storm or storm event from overwhelming those networks, preventing the pumps from operating correctly from causing issues along that network and in resulting in and more large inflows into your treatment works. Energy management by load shedding will give the pump stations more adequate and ample time to gently send those loads and the, the inflows across the treatment works during the day rather than using a lot of energy in one and you can use your energy when it's cheaper such as in the middle of the night or in the very early morning. Improved environmental management will stop overflows flooding events, problems in combined sewer outfalls, which will then lead to a better environmental footprint and also improve the, the environment for yourself and your neighbours who have to live next to these pumping stations. So how does centralised catchment management work? So here we have a, a pumping station. We've got two pumps. We have an inflow, we have an overflow, and we also have a a rising main up and out of the station to send that flow away. So we can use set point profiles and there's six available here of which we can determine those levels at which optimum pumping is achieved at various situations and criteria to enable that to work efficiently. So here in our example is our two pump pumping station and we're going to use three set point profiles only so we have here our default pump on and default pump off. This will be our standard profile for normal operation 
and that will enable us to have a default setting to work during the majority of the day. Here we have a high level pump on and off and this is where we can then send that station to a higher level and maintain the level between these two points should there be any problems further along in the network that require us to, to slow down our discharge from this station into the onward receiving networks, into the terminal pumping stations and into the wastewater treatment works. And finally, we have our low level, which is our pump on and off, and that will give us the maximum available storage for any potential upcoming events. So if we know there's a storm coming, we can then have a lower level here to enable that to take more inflow before we have to pump and we can then move those set points around depending on what's happening in the network. So pump profiles and these profiles here and the levels that we start our pumps on and off at can change on various different triggers. So time, at various times of the day that we can use different profiles according to how we want to manage that flow into the treatment works. Digital events, so an on off. So if a float tips or a high level, we can change a level in a onward or receiving station accordingly to ensure that we get the best management of these pumping stations. An analog event. So we detect an analog level. So something from an ultrasonic which tells us that the level's higher than it usually is or is very low, we can then use that as well to manage onward receiving and the current pumping station. We can also change this remotely via DMP3 over native or WITS, which is the water industrial telemetry standards. So we can take remote control of our pumping station via DMP3 which is native or WITS or Modbus from different equipment that sits in the pumping station MCC or we can take that from a user interface directly on the panel itself. So let's have a look at an example of how this works live. So we've got an, our example which is our dry weather flow treatment plant and we're going to look at the demand management and how that's controlled on there. So we have our typical graph there of how flows are managed throughout the day and how they generally work in. So as you see there at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., everybody's starting to get up, starting to have showers, starting to use the toilets and starting to increase the demand on the networks, which then peaks off over the day and then dips right down and then comes back up towards the early evening when everybody starts to get home and starts to use the toilets, the showers, and starts to increase that demand again on the, on the network onwards and receiving, which then tails off as we go along towards the evening and the early hours when there's very little flow whatsoever until that all starts again. So what we, what we want to do is manage that. So as you can see there, the blue curve is the, the standard and how we, we usually see these inflows arrive into treatment works. And the, the purple there is how we would like to manage those, those times and, and how that flow comes in to smooth that out over the day to make that a little bit more manageable. And that has several benefits. So we can optimize our wastewater treatment works process efficiency. So we can make those treatment works work better by smoothing those flows out. They're not overwhelmed and they can handle this in a more normal way. We can improve the aeration efficiency and reduce energy, which has various benefits in energy, carbon footprints and all sorts of other aspects there. We can reduce the amount of chemicals we need to use in those treatment works. So we're using less, which is better for the environment. We're not having to use more at peaks and we can use that throughout the day to smooth this out and to treat that inflow and the effluent as we go along. We can maintain consent. So we're, 
we don't have to worry so much about who's discharging excess at certain points. We can then manage that from the stations and slowly bring that into our treatment works. And finally, we can maintain our biological stability. So all of the natural biological organisms in the treatment plant are stable. They don't have to be managed and they will survive and thrive and, and do their job effectively in the treatment works. So a non-compliant combined sewer overflow event avoidance and response management could look like this. We have here our, our network with various pumping stations, holding tanks on various limbs and with all with various capabilities and capacities. So on the A limb there, which is our branch, we've got various pumping stations and they're at various levels, which is the same for the B and the C. So at B5, we see that a fault occurs and our B7 station is likely to want to discharge into that. So we then get a warning and the catcher management takes over, sends all of those feeding stations to maximum storage. So every pumping station along there has an activated high level pumping profile where we allow the level to go much higher to keep up and to give that pumping state the onward pumping stations more time to then resolve that problem to keep that effective and to reduce that time to spill because what we don't want there is an environmental incident causing us a problem and that time to spill information we know is eight hours, 45 minutes. That can either be inputted directly into the catchment management or that can be calculated by the telemetry units or the pump controllers on that station itself. And that event has happened at 3.30 in the morning on a Monday. So overnight, we don't have so many engineers on standby. They may be dealing with other incidents. So we can then manage that we know our time of how long we've got on that station. We know that all the other stations have been sent to maximum storage, so they're not sending huge amounts of inflow into that receiving station at B5. This then gives us our amber. We know that we have some time and we can then prepare to resolve this. So we then resolve our fault in B5. That could be for a block pump or a tripped control panel or some other occurrence or fault that's happened there. And all of our feeding stations can be systematically restored back into normal operation and put back to normal work. So we can then continue as we expect and we can manage our pumping station profiles as they should be. That gives us our green light again. And we've activated our default pumping profiles once again for our optimum energy efficiency which will save energy and mean that those pumping stations are working exactly as they should. So we've got seven steps so we can implement centralized catchment management. And in the first, we need to plan. We need to work out how we're going to implement this on our networks and our treatment plants. So we can do this via site surveys. We can send engineers out to site to examine the stations, to gather information on what they've got, how they operate, and where they're currently set. Use workshops. We can examine this and discuss with colleagues to see where that sits. We can use local data that may be existing on site that gives us an idea of how those stations are running, what levels they're working at, and how they're generally operating. We can use SCADA data so we can take that from top ends and we can use that to examine and to look at how that's working. And then we can standardize that across all of our networks and our treatment works and then document how that's going to be moved along. On the second stage, we're looking to then install. So we're gonna use trained authorized installers to implement and install the telemetry equipment the pump controllers that will enable us to then implement centralized catch and management across the network 
And then we're going to commission these stations onto the centralised catchment management to ensure they're working correctly. We'll check site functionality. We'll look at auto resets. We'll use tariff avoidance. So we'll try and make that work during the cheapest energy usage to enable us to get the best return for our investment. We can then use set point profiling to look at how that works. We can then implement reversing technologies and we can check all the data we've got and make sure that's then applicable to what we're going to do. And we're going to integrate that into our catchment management system. We're going to update our SCADA screens and mimics. We're going to check the data and we're going to look at the reporting to see how that's working and if that's effective. We can then optimize how all of our pumping stations work using the data we have and the, the way the system works and how we want to use that to smooth out our flows into the treatment works to enable that to work energy efficient and to be a biggest benefit to that. So we can do this looking at site resilience. If sites can handle various pumping profiles on their, their system, the site levels to see whether we've got the, the optimum efficiency and the optimum opportunity to install these. We can then look at the benefits for each site. We can check our data integrity. And then we can analyze how that's working whether it's bringing any benefit. We can take that data to information modeling, to testing and to business change. And then we can implement it fully across the network. And that gives us our full life cycle of change management. So moving on to that, we will then have in each station, we'll be looking at pump controllers and level control. For the pumps, our main aim is to reduce energy consumption so that we're not using as much energy on what, when we're pumping. We can use that at optimum speed profiles. We can then eliminate nuisance callouts where you don't always have to lift a pump, but you can get that reset. You can also reset the pumps to make sure that the they're working okay. You can use your live data to ensure there's no problems with that. We can then use this information for predictive maintenance where you can then use this to assess, do we need to service the pumping stations regularly? Do we need to do it three monthly, six monthly? Can they wait a year or another schedule of which is preferred? We can then quickly retrofit this to deliver benefits by scale across the network so that they're installed and they're ready to go and we can make that work on the network. We can enable smarter networks across the board there. We can use level information for transport pumping stations and lift stations and package pumping stations to start and stop those pumps, to bring on high level alarms to warn of any problems, as well as low level alarms for all these intake street stations to wastewater treatment plants. Now I'll hand back over to Hannah, who's going to talk about dashboards. Sorry, condition-based monitoring even. Yeah, I'm going to start off with <laughs> yeah. condition-based monitoring. Thank you, Hannah. It's very effective to identify and warn operators of potential and upcoming problem. And why is this then important? It's because the life cycle cost to support um, equipment out in pumping station can often have very high costs. They can range from five to 15 times as much as the original purchase cost. So more and more attention is often spent on the larger installations since these are often critical and expensive equipment. We typically want to avoid unnecessary disturbances. Resources should also be used where they are really needed. Maintenance costs should be lowered. Installation and servicing time should be kept to a minimum. And pumps should be better kept track of from an identity and cost point of view. Operations and maintenance managers are facing less people to do more mentality, time constraints, cost focus, less experts around, and the people changes job more often than before. This means that every data we can read and make uh, sense of will help us in our work. So leakage and temp me measurements are crucial. 
but we are also ex um, extending this to measuring current and vibration. Combining this together with power and voltage measurements, you get a very good overview of your pump. In our system, we have featured alarms on monitor values. You can get notification on when different services are due and notification on wear parts counters when several different wear parts in the pumps should be looked over from a running hour perspective. By monitoring these values and having warning alerts uh, levels in a system, we try to avoid reactive callouts and cost and give you a predictive counter measurements in order to plan and use your preventive spendings in a more efficient way. With store warning and data of all these, it's also easier to investigate and get knowledge of what have happened in the pump station. This allows you to adjust and make sure you can avoid future incidents based on the same way of working. So in our system, we, have, um, we are looking very much into the servicing of the pumps. We make sure you have service reminders and you have a pump ID already implemented from the factory. And you have a very powerful diagnostic tool that is utilizing a concept of black boxes for fault identifications. Uh, I think, Paul, if you can just uh, bring up some more pictures on this one so they can see a little bit what we are talking about. We are want to avoid these type of incidents and using these uh, diagnostic tools to um, spend time on fault tracing. With the increased trend data memory that we have, you have a greater chance of finding the actual root cause of the incident. So you have a very typical way of looking at a blo blocked pump and when you have all this data that you can see in the table here, if you put them all together and make analysis, you can often uh, understand what has happened before. Sometimes it's not so easy, so it's just a blocked pump. There can also be other things that has happened in, inside a pump. So this is all great that we are reading all of the vibration, the leakage, the motor temperature and so on. Um, and that we have all of this data available in our system. But it's most important also is that you can integrate it into your already existing systems that you have and give you a complete overview remotely of your equipment. So the data that you're logging, it needs to be transferred and brought into analysis mode in order to be meaningful. So we have uh, on the pictures here, you can see the type of equipment we have on the pumping stations that are logging data and also units that are transferring data into any um, um, uh, SCADA system uh, or um, cloud systems. So many tend to have a lot of data that is stuck sometimes in the station and because of difficult of integration and that it's maybe even costly. So you need to know which parameters to read and how to interpret the data and the reasons and the behaviors behind these numbers. So if we take up a couple of more clicks here, you can see the type of dashboards or interfaces that we are using within Silem to give you insights on your actual pumping station. Here you can read live data, what is going, out, going on outside in your pumping station right now. But you can also have functionality that shows the trends historically, what has happened, and you can deep dive into the different data points and find meaningful um, information there. If we move on to our dashboard. Today we want to work with dashboard. We have many systems that are not always linked together. To have the possibility to have an overview of your alarms and how to handle the alarms, different groups of people at different times. Someone wants to have maybe text messages and at the same time other needs to be notified uh, in a more convenient way over email. So having a dashboard give you an overview and give you the possibility to do different actions. Um, you can see uh, the exact locations of your station. You can see actual live data of your station, but also access um, history and reports. We also need to take into account that people today, we want to be able to access this information at any time and on any device. So mobile apps is an absolute must and needed. 
And at the same time, even if you have a lot of people who are accessing the system, you want to differentiate and give different type of privileges to certain groups in your um, working environment. So some are maybe only able to read, and some should also be able to write and give different commands. And, and in, uh, to have an analytic parts, you give an easy way to visualize and make intelligent decisions that are optimized for your network based on the data that we have available from your um, network. So talk a little bit of the future of digital services. Um, I think we all can agree upon that we are living in a data-driven world. The main issue that many are facing today is that we have too much data. And at the same time, we had very little meaningful data or very little insights. In, in a system today, we have various level of access points where data is stored and looked on. It can be, if you look at the very bottom here in this picture, you can have in intelligent machines that can prevent certain failures and human interfaces. Uh, and at another level, you might have an intelligent pumping station that is making adaptation uh, at its own environment and making smart decision, optimizing how you operate both your equipment and your pumping station. We are launching something called Xylem Advancer. It's a system that are connecting both intelligent and less smarter station into one system. And from here, you can get better insights and possibilities to make smarter decision in your network of pumping station. We know that many of you already have an existing SCADA business management system or asset management system. So it's therefore important for us that the level of expertise that we can offer in our system can link to any existing system through APIs. Because we don't want you to get stuck with five, six different systems that doesn't interact because then you don't get the dashboard and the possibilities to make smart de decision in your complete network. So Silom, we aim to deliver smart, self-optimizing products and system, delivering data and insights to the next higher order system. Silom and our partners are ready to act on these insights to deliver enhanced services. So you can choose the way uh, and the level that you want to have uh, from Silom uh, in this pyramid of different intelligence level. I think that is our large picture here. So we are moving into the question sites now. And I have seen that some questions are coming in in the Q&A section. So... Should we do one each, Hannah? Yep. Yeah. So will auto reversing work on all pumps? Yes. It will work on all xylem pumps and flight pumps. Yeah, some good. some competitors' models might not support reversing. So these features that we activate on our systems can be deactivated. So looking at next question was can some of the solutions you offer mentioned on slide nine be added to existing pump stations yes we can add those to an existing pumping station adding one of our smart run products or alternatively replacing with concerta pumps some panel modifications may be required at the same time So there's another question there. It says, well, running at pumps at lower speeds and self-cleansing velocities could lead to issues in the rising main. Any issues will be negated by the pipe cleaning feature, which will then run at full speed and ensure that any sediment in the main is removed and, and cleared out. Can the data collected be transmitted to our existing top end system using standard protocols? I think. Uh, Paul mentioned a couple of them. We have uh, DNP3, uh, we have um, native and WITS, and we have uh, Modbus uh, protocols that we are using uh, in most of our systems. I don't know if you have any more specifics from the UK market you want to mention, Paul? Uh, mainly it's WITS and sort of protocols sort of similar to that. 
So the next question is with centralized catcher management, can the automatic management be overridden? Yes, it can. That can be via a top end from SCADA, that can be from local intervention, and you can always turn that off to suit the conditions that are working there. Uh, is there any link to live rainfall information to try and optimize the pumping and anticipated flows to the network to a storm flow event? Yes, I think we have. Yes, we can on those. They, uh, that is a possibility with the data we can collect in from sensors and various yeah. options around there. So next question is, do we collect flow and pressure data for condition monitoring? Yes, we do. We can collect that via sensors within the station. It can detect the levels as they move along and it can also re copy in the pressure as well and use that. Or we can bring that into the SCADA and change profiles, of course, in our telemetry units. Um, can existing or any available monitoring system identify low flow cavitation and suction recirculation? Yes, I think we have that in our AAI system. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Paul. I think we do, yes. Yeah. It, is in, it is in the AIA, which is our and analytics I, infrastructure. Yeah. And can you make our concerter pump? This one I know by heart. No. <laughs> and if you want to mega it, make sure you have a very low voltage. The, the manual will state which one you are allowed to use. Yeah, definitely don't mega a concerter pump. It's got electronics in there that will be damaged by that. Uh, the next question there is when telemetry fails will link stations fails no because what will happen is those telemetry units will then the, the top end SCADA will see that 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 station has failed and will ultimately send receiving the feeding stations to high levels and also raise alarms so that that can be investigated to see if there is any problems with that station if they arrive and find that there is no problem with the station that can be then overridden and the the system can work as normal until the telemetry issue is resolved if it's nothing to do with any problems on site or even with any any alarms or indication that that's not working How is consented flow guaranteed within the centralized catchment management system? It can work on auto, so you need to be talking with the SCADA necessarily, and uh, the constant, constant, constant flow. Is that what is meaning? Consented flow is what is allowed onwards. So it can, it can measure and can look at what, what is allowed during the day and then can, can regulate how that fits and where it sits in. But it can't guarantee it, so to speak, but it can measure that and compensate it as much as possible. I think that's all the questions I have seen so far in the Q&A. Is indeed. Does anybody else have any questions? Please type them now. No, that seems to be the end of all questions. Should you have 
any further questions, please let your local Xylem representative know. They can then pass them on to us and we can answer them as required. I think we'll end that here today. Thank you very much for attending. Oh, sorry, there, there are some more questions. There are some more. There's one more. How long does a typical retrofit take? It is dependent on the size of the MCC and how much you need to put in there. And that will then get, that will then govern how long that needs to be done. So it could, could be space in a MCC. It could be installs. Generally though, if you're adding in telemetry or pump controllers, a day or two should be okay. But essentially it's, um, it's very dependent on each station and won't be the same for all. I think that is about it. So no, you have you. another one as well, an ultrasonic with six oh. reels that popped in. <laughs> Looking at that, we will confirm. We've got a few other companies who can look at that option, and we'll come back to you on that. And from a practical point of view, the. Um, we have gotten a question of the recording of the presentation, if it can be emailed. I think it will be shared on, on some of our channels, right, Paul? Yes, this will be on YouTube. Yeah. So you can always email the YouTube link to your colleagues, Alan. Excellent. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining today. It's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll end it there. Thank you. <laughs>